after sailing across the entirety of the Pacific Ocean, German Vice Admiral Maximilian von Spee now cruised off the South American coast, preparing to attack the light cruiser HMS Glasgow when he had discovered her in the harbor of Coronel. He knew she was there because of a German supply ship, the Gottingen, which was giving him intelligence. Unfortunately for von Spee, the British had been listening in on the German radio traffic and knew he was close. However, this in turn was a ruse set up by the Germans, which baited the British perfectly. Von Spee had ordered all of his vessels to use the call sign of one of his light cruisers, Leipzig. As a result, Glasgow believed that there was only one enemy ship nearby, a lone light cruiser, and she subsequently radioed British Rear Admiral Sir Christopher Craddock her findings. Craddock now began racing northwards towards Coronel at full speed, planning to catch up with Glasgow so they could intercept Leipzig, whilst von Spee simultaneously sped south in hopes of pinning Glasgow in the harbor of Coronel, where she could easily be destroyed. Thus, neither side had any idea that they were running headlong into battle with the other, believing that they were only after a single ship. On November 1st, 1914, the forces met. At this point, the East Asiatic Squadron was comprised of two armored and three light cruisers, all under the command of Vice Admiral von Spee. These included the armored cruisers Scharnhorst and Neisenau, and the light cruisers Dresden, Leipzig, and Nuremberg. Von Spee as a commander was an expert in naval gunnery and had drilled his ships intensively before the war, such that they were widely regarded as the best shots in the Imperial German Navy. Additionally, the officers who led this force had been handpicked by Admiral Alfred von Tirpitz, who insisted that this far station must be made up of the best of the best if it ever hoped to make up for numerical inferiority in a fight. Despite enduring a long voyage across the Pacific, the Germans had remained a strong fighting force, with strict discipline being maintained and all efforts made to ensure morale stayed high, despite the fact that their chances of survival and return to Germany were slim. The British forces were almost a perfect contrast to the German East Asiatic Squadron. For everything the Germans were, the British were not. The Royal Navy, for its part, contributed two armored cruisers, a light cruiser, and one auxiliary cruiser. The armored cruisers, HMS Monmouth and HMS Goodhope, were both far older than von Spee's ships of this type, and worse still were outgunned by them. HMS Glasgow, the light cruiser, had been more recently built, but there was only one of her and three ships equal to her capabilities on the German side. The auxiliary cruiser, HMS Atranjo, was, well, shall we say a glorified ocean liner that had absolutely no business fighting in this battle whatsoever. Craddock was a competent commander, if a little gung-ho, as he had been described by his colleagues as constitutionally incapable of refusing action. However, the forces he had been given did not provide him the flexibility to play to this strength, with not only the ships being older, but also the men mostly being made up of reservists, who had far less experience than regulars. All of this makes many historians wonder why Craddock chose to engage von Spee, because even though he had enthusiasm for battle, he was not a reckless man who was willing to get all of his sailors killed just for some action and glory. The largest piece of evidence that has been able to explain this decision was the result of the Trowbridge Court Martial, a case which had left the officers of the Royal Navy with the firm message that they were always to engage any enemy force, no matter the numerical or qualitative disparity. With these ships at their backs, Von Spee and Craddock came roaring towards one another head-on, and at 0915 hours on November 1st, Glasgow left Coronel to rendezvous with Craddock. When she arrived, she was unable to communicate with the flagship using her boats as the sea conditions were brutally violent, only being able to inform the Admiral of her findings by sending them across a line lowered into the sea between the two ships. At 13.05 hours, Craddock ordered his forces to form up line abreast and steam at 10 knots, with 15 miles of separation between each ship in effort to find what he believed was Leipzig. Later, at 16.17 hours, Leipzig, leading the German ships, spotted smoke on the horizon, and von Spee subsequently directed the light cruiser and his two armored cruisers to increase to full speed, leaving the slower Dresden and Nuremberg behind. Three minutes after, Glasgow and Otranto sighted von Spee's smoke and the three ships making it at a distance of about 12 miles. Reversing his course, Craddock now steamed in the same direction as the Germans, trying to buy time for himself to reassess the situation as he had not anticipated encountering von Spee's entire squadron. Craddock's two armored cruisers and his one light cruiser were fast enough to run from the Germans, but doing this would mean leaving Otranto to her fate. While the British Admiral weighed his options, 
Von Spee took the initiative, slowing down at a range of eight and a half miles and repositioning to ensure that the British ships would be silhouetted against the setting sun to the west when they came into range, providing perfect targets. Running out of time, Craddock finally decided he would stand and fight at 1710 hours, drawing his ships closer in. Again, he changed course, now turning southeast, hoping to make contact with the Germans while he still had the light. It was now von Spee's turn to decline the engagement, using his faster ship's speed to keep away from Craddock, maintaining a distance just short of eight miles. At 1850, the sun finally set, and like a great eagle swooping down on its prey, von Spee turned towards his enemy and opened fire at 12,000 yards. It was at this longer range in the earlier phase of the action that the German numerical superiority in heavy guns became painfully apparent. Scharnhorst and Neisenau collectively had 16 8-inch guns, compared to Craddock's two 9.2-inch weapons on Good Hope. Within the first five minutes of battle, von Spee's tireless efforts in gunnery practice yielded results, landing a hit on one of the 9.2-inch guns, taking it out of the fight. While the British, under normal circumstances, did have an advantage over their enemy in the numerous six-inch guns aboard their armored cruisers, the heavy seas made these all but impossible to use, depriving Craddock of one of his most important weapons. Meanwhile, a Tranto quickly turned west and retreated at full speed. In spite of his difficulties with the six-inch guns, Craddock still tried to close the range with von Spee to enable himself to make use of them. This presented a problem for the British, for as they got closer, the German fire became increasingly more accurate. Nevertheless, by 1930 hours, Craddock had managed to close to 6,000 yards. This effort was in vain, however, as the ever-mounting German hits had resulted in fires breaking out on Monmouth and Good Hope, illuminating them perfectly for the Germans across the now darkened waters. By contrast, Craddock found it nearly impossible to score hits on his enemy, as they were obscured by the inky blackness of night. Finally, Monmouth's guns fell silent. Craddock aboard Good Hope was determined to die hard, charging towards the German forces who blasted away relentlessly at the battered British warship. At 1950 hours, the guns of Craddock's flagship stopped firing, and her forward magazine detonated, sending her to the bottom at 1957 hours with no survivors. Good Hope now out of the picture, von Spee redirected Scharnhorst's fire onto Monmouth, while Neisenau and Leipzig engaged Glasgow. John Luce, captain of the only remaining operable British ship, recognized that with Neisenau's eight-inch guns firing on him, there was little he could do but be destroyed along with Craddock by the superior force. Observing that the enemy was using the flash from his guns to adjust their shots, he ceased firing and sailed to the now-darkened Monmouth. Realizing that the ship was sinking and that there was little to be done, Luce and Glasgow turned south and fled into the night his ship having a whole compartment flooded from the damage. The East Asiatic Squadron was left somewhat confused in the dark, unaware as to the fate of the two armored cruisers that they had given such a thrashing. Nuremberg, having finally caught up with von Spee's forces after being left behind at the outset of the chase, spotted Monmouth, and von Spee tried to signal the British to surrender, shining his searchlights on the enemy ensign. When no action was taken, the Germans opened fire, finishing off what little remained of the British ship, at 2118 hours. One final matter of the battle remained to be resolved. Glasgow, who had managed to escape, steamed south for three full days before transiting the Straits of Magellan. Canopus, who had been slowly en route to reinforce Craddock, was ordered to turn around. The old pre-dreadnought continued to break down, twice reporting she was not under control and breaking down a third time before she and Glasgow finally reached Port Stanley in the Falklands where the decision was quickly made to beach her so she could serve as a defensive battery. Otranto, for her part, had steamed 230 miles west before her captain finally deemed it safe enough to turn south and round Cape Horn. The Germans had gotten off almost scot-free, with Scharnhorst taking two hits, Neisenau four, none of which caused any substantial damage. Only three German sailors were wounded. The real casualties had been the cost of ammunition. Scharnhorst had fired 422 shells, leaving her with only 350 remaining. Neisenau fared somewhat better, having fired 244 with a larger supply of 528 shells still available. For the Royal Navy, this was the first defeat since the Battle of Lake Champlain in 1814, and the first defeat of a squadron since the Battle of Grandport in 1810. Two armored cruisers had been sunk, and 1,600 British men were dead including Rear Admiral Craddock. This loss shocked the nation, 
for whom the Navy meant life or death. On the German side, there was incredible jubilation. Sailing back into the Chilean port of Valparaiso, throngs of crowds made up of the German population living there cheered the East Asiatic Squadron's victory. Von Spee, however, refused to celebrate and became inexorably melancholy. Knowing exactly what victory had meant, Von Spee was aware that to have won the Battle of Coronel was to have signed his own death warrant. The British would now never rest until he was dead and his ships were at the bottom of the sea for this humiliation. When presented with flowers for his victory, he infamously remarked, These shall do nicely for my grave. Von Spee was right. Immediately, British Admiralty began working feverishly to prepare forces to send south to eradicate the East Asiatic Squadron off the face of the planet. Admiral Fisher, now in command once again, saw this moment for what it was worth as a testing ground for his theories on the battlecruiser, and ordered HMS Invincible and HMS Inflexible to steam south to Plymouth to receive an overhaul in preparation for service abroad. In the same way that von Spee had swiftly destroyed his inferior foe, now it was the British turn to unleash hell upon their enemy. Thank you so much for watching. If you have a suggestion for a future video, please leave it in the comments below.